Oh yeah, because I was engaging in a monologue with uh, myself, you know, what has happened the last two days and, uh, you know, uh, what value, I ask myself the question, Singhal, what value can you add? Because uh, the program uh, uh, title for the morning is something about public value. So I said, Singhal, what value can you add to what has already been said? Because most of what I wanted to say has already been said. <laughs> so uh, this, uh, this monologue or dialogue or trilogue or uh, public hog uh, is, uh, I see that my translators are laughing. <laughs> Uh, is that stream of consciousness that I engaged in uh, this morning. Oh, okay. So uh, I was somehow reminded of uh, Mr. Reagan, uh, you know, uttering those beautiful words, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, uh, tear down the wall. And uh, uh, that's actually a very good metaphor of the kind of monologue that I was uh, engaging in. Uh, because I felt that, uh, you know, we all deal with walls and we try to scale walls and we try to build bridges sometimes. And uh, clearly when you talk of entertainment, education, you are talking about building bridges because there probably are walls. Uh, and uh, so that's the metaphorical theme which will guide this uh, uh, monologue and how appropriate, you know, I've chosen my setting. Uh, to be in Berlin and to uh, use this uh, metaphor. Well, let's see if this works. So a uh, lot of questions. I mean, a monologue is, you know, you ask yourself a few questions. And so there are a lot of questions that I was asking myself. And sometimes you don't even know what the value of these questions are. And uh, the question that uh, I began to ask uh, myself is, what is the value of a dream? Because you know we all have some dreams and aspirations. Uh, Marion and Christoph and our dear friends who are you know they have a dream. Uh, we have some kind of a dream about what the role of academics is and what the role of producers and scriptwriters are. What our role is in society. So they're personalized dreams and perhaps a little uh, more than our individual dreams. There's some collective dreams. So in posing the question, what is the value of a dream, you know, you have to sort of go back to, I have a dream someday that, uh, you know, my four little children will live in a world where they would be not judged by the color of their skin, but uh, <laughs> by the content of their character, you know. A dream which uh, has been around for some time, and maybe we are making some progress, and uh, maybe we have some ways to go, but that's the nature of dreams. And you wonder when Mr. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation over 150 years ago, you know, maybe he had a dream, and I wonder what he's thinking as he's looking at uh, Barack from behind. No? So what's the value? What's the public value of a dream? What's the social value of a dream? What's the collective value of our dreams, our individual and collective dreams? Mr. Mandela, what kind of a South Africa do you dream about and well I dream of a South Africa which is neither which is not just for the blacks and it's not just for the whites but I dream of a South Africa that is a rainbow so what's the public and social value of dreams Rainbow, no? Appropriate metaphor. 
what does it uh, take to implement a dream? Well, that's a logical question. Or at least it was part of my monologue. And uh, for some reason, and this happens to me quite a lot, uh, uh, <coughs> this guy appears in my dreams once in a while. Uh, and this morning he did. So, Mr. Gandhi, what does it take to implement a dream? And is it shedding clothes? And he says, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you going to wear these clothes when you meet uh, the king? Uh, yeah. Would you feel comfortable going there as a half-naked fakir? as Winston Churchill uh, called him. And he said, yeah, I, yeah, uh, I will indeed go in these clothes, because I know that His Majesty would be wearing enough for the both of us. <laughs> what does it take to implement the dream, Mr. Gandhi? Uh, and he says, well, uh, travel third class. Traveling third class, no? But why would you travel third class, Mr. Gandhi? In the early 1900s, when he was a lawyer in South Africa, he had a practice which at that time netted him the equivalent of 30,000 US dollars at that time a month. That's what his practice was worth. There were over 100 people on his payroll. 90% of the cases that he took were solved out of court. He thought that was more humane. That was his dream. So, heck, why would you travel third class, Mr. Gandhi? Surely afford to go first class. And uh, he says, well, my friend, you know, I travel third class because there is no fourth class. So what does it take to implement a dream? Shed clothes, travel fourth class. Mother Teresa, we are so happy you're here in Washington, DC. Welcome. My child, I'm very happy to be here. Tomorrow we are having a march in Washington. And uh, we would like for you, mother, to march with us. And she says, my child, what is the march about? Mother, the march is against the Vietnam War. And we would love for you to march with us. And my child, I'm sorry. <gasps> I'm not going to participate in your dream. But why not, mother? So if your dream is to march against the Vietnam War, please count me out. But if you wish to march for peace, I'm happy to be part of that dream. So what does it take to implement a dream? You're saying, where the heck is he going with this? I'm asking myself, no, this is a monologue. You go anywhere. So, can one entertain the mint of dream? You know, there's a dream. And perhaps our dreams are different. But maybe, you know, we have an idea of what the mint of dream is. There's the notion of increasing enrollments in STEM. There's the notion of equal opportunity. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, my grandfather was a professor of mathematics. And uh, he lived uh, with us, my father and his family, uh, for the last six years of his life after he retired. He died in a road accident. but. Uh, uh, he sort of entertained the mint of dream uh, at any opportunity that he got. So he would ask the question, do you know why your mother has just cut the sandwich 
as a diagonal as opposed to straight. Why is it a triangle, no? And then it's, hmm. And of course, you know, then he has you face the, the diagonal side. And you say, oh, God, I'm getting more cheese, and I'm getting more lettuce, and I'm getting more eggs. Yeah, the diagonal is longer than any of the sides. No. So we learned about uh, Pythagoras' theorem as we were talking about cutting sandwiches. He would say, why do, you, uh, why do you hold a pencil that is hexagonal? So yeah, I am holding a pencil which is a hexagon. Oh, don't know. It's easier to hold. Oh yeah. It doesn't roll off the table. Oh yeah. So, uh -huh, yeah, you're right. But do you know that if you take a piece of wood and you want to make 10 pencils out of a unit piece of wood, you can do it if you cut a pencil as a hexagonal. If you cut it as a rounded pencil, you'll only get nine. Oh, so I was learning my precision engineering as I was holding a pencil. Or you would say, why do you know that this slab of chocolate that you're going to share with others has indents and can be broken into pieces, of course, it's so that you don't feel guilty about eating the entire bar. It gives you that option. It socially constructs your reality that you can have one piece. Otherwise, your one piece is that big piece. But you know, then you learn about areas and squares and volumes and so we all have dreams, no? How can we entertain them? And my grandfather, I guess, knew. Can the walls come tumbling down? So there is this wall, one wall. And you, know, you can use the metaphor, tear down this wall, or you can say scale this wall, or climb the wall, or bridge the wall, is the wall between what's real and what's real. And uh, how are we doing on time, uh, sir? We are one minute left, or? Wow, OK, perfect. Does, uh, do some of us recognize the gentleman who is Dr. Albert Bandura? And do some of us know what's going on behind him? The Bobo doll, Andrea, is that what you're saying? Yeah. And what, uh, what was happening to the Bobo doll? This probably was one of the most significant experiments. When it comes to, let's say, the uh, intellectual uh, capital that Mintif wants to tap into, uh, this was perhaps the most significant experiment that was ever conducted. Why? Because it broke down the wall between the real and the real. So preschoolers at Stanford University, young children, Mr. Bandura, social psychologist, brings them in a lab. And he shows them a role model, a model, a real person, who walks into a room, a room where there are these bobo dolls, dolls that, do we know bobo dolls? The dolls that are anchored in the base. And you hit them, and they bounce back at you. And so the model enters the room and kicks and punches and hammers these bobo dolls. And he had made sure that these young children had not been exposed to bobo dolls before. And then these children are let into the room. And what do you think they do? Andrea, what do they do? They do the same. They kick and punch and hammer these bobo dolls. And then you ask the question, where did they learn this from? 